my name is Jan Friedrich from uh, Fitch Ratings. I'm the head of Middle East Africa uh, Sovereigns. And the plan for me today is to present on a bit about the global economic outlook and global outlook for sovereigns, and then focusing it in and honing in on the outlook for the GCC and, and the sovereigns in the GCC. So, I mean, clearly a good thing to start right now is always with the status of the pandemic. Um, of course, it's, it's far from over, uh, but one thing that is very important and very, very clear is that, of course, uh, vaccination rates globally have, have risen quite sharply, quite substantially. And so the key takeaway for the economic perspective from that is essentially that, and as we can see on the right hand side of, of the slide, the, the reaction to the to, to recent new waves of the pandemic has declined. Every new wave of the pandemic, the economy has adapted, policymakers have adapted. And so the economic impact has become lesser, of course, more so in countries where vaccination, vaccination rates are high. But um, even globally, even in, in those parts of the world, particularly in emerging markets where vaccination rates are lower, that is also the case. Um, second main point from the global perspective is, is just where we stand on the, uh, on the recovery front we have seen a very rapid recovery. Um, if you look at the growth rate for, for the world in 2021 as a whole, um, it would be the fastest rate of, of economic growth that we've seen since, since 1973. Um, so clearly at this stage, you, it's, it would be very hard to talk of economic stag um, of, uh, of, of stagflation. Um, we have uh, China, of course, already above pre-pandemic levels since the second quarter of last year, the US hitting that level in the second quarter of 2021, and the euro area as the three main economic areas getting there pretty quickly towards the end of, of this year. Um, very clearly, uh, in addition to the progress on vaccinations and the adaptation of the economy to the pandemic, very, very, very important in this I think much faster than expected economic recovery is the degree of stimulus that the world has seen in particularly in particular from the US as obviously also uh, the, the biggest economy, both because the US is, is so big, but also because the stimulus in the US was just so extremely, extremely strong. On the right hand side, we see the aggregate stimulus from the beginning of 2020 to the sec to the to the first half of 2021 around 25% of GDP stimulus from the US, um, that clearly was a very, very important driver for, for the strong growth. But um, what also is very important to recognize now that we are, we are peak, peak growth, um, peak recovery pace, and, we, uh, and that is to some extent because we, we have also passed the, the point of peak stimulus. Um, of course, in the US, for example, there is still stimulus in the pipeline, the, the administration is talking about uh, large, large further spending packages. But firstly, there's a, a fair amount of doubt on whether they will be implemented. But more importantly, um, the scale of these packages is just so much smaller than, than what, what has been approved, because to some extent, they will be implemented over, over many years. And so the, the impact would be only around 0.5%, even if everything came through, 0.5% of US GDP in 2022 and 0.9% in 2020, um, 2023. Um, now, uh, the very strong recovery has, has certainly had come with some, some challenges. And that's essentially one of the parts of this puzzle that everyone is now talking about in terms of global and US inflation. Um, so the first part of that puzzle is the, the very strong recovery of uh, consumer durables in the United States. At the peak on the, on the left-hand side, um, at, on the peak, the consumer durable demand in nominal terms um, in I think April 2021 was 40% above 
not the trough of the crisis, but the pre-pandemic -pre level. So 40% above that level. And um, I, many for, for, for those of you who work actually in, in, in producing companies, um, imagining uh, that suddenly the, the, your, your organization would be facing demand 40% uh, on top of what is normally being produced. Um, it it can, has to be unsurprising that that has has had a a price response as well as as a so far relatively limited volume response. So that's the first part of this very strong surge in in U.S. inflation and to some extent in global inflation. But of course, the other thing is that we now are also seeing a significant recovery, slower but significant recovery. Um, on non-durable goods and, and services. And that is maybe the one, the, these are the things that people are probably a little bit more worried about. We are pretty confident that durable goods demand will be normalizing as, as demand is shifting, shifting towards non-durables and services again, which were basically not consumable during much of 2020. Um, and and so that pressure will be will be declining. It will still be there for some time, but it will be declining. While the the particularly the service sector inflation will gradually be coming back. Um, and of course, services are still in the U.S. and many advanced economies a dominant part of of the economy. And of course, this this combination of a very very sharp um, current inflation, mainly driven by consumer durables, and questions. And pressures on on medium term inflation from things like services and wages mean that the the debate about the about monetary policy has clearly changed. Um, the 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 tapering in the U.S. will start before the end of the year. Um, uh, purchases will will stop by by sometime next next year. Um, interest rates will be rising 22, 20, 22 or twenty three. Um, still relatively open, but um, in addition to that, there will be the ECB, which I mean, is quite a bit further uh, further behind, but um, still um, should be ex should be expected to to start the tapering of of asset uh, purchases as well, uh, so that the support for the global economy, not just from fiscal policy as we saw before, but also from monetary policy, will be will be decreasing at least um, over the next one or two years. At the same time, another factor that has tended to be quite important in driving global growth, China, is also coming a little bit under pressure, mainly from the side of, um, of the property sector. Um, not talking really so much of, um, um, of the, the, the crisis right now in, on, for specific property companies, but more just the, the impact of the tighter regulations since um, in China of, of the property sector, as well as the declining um, credit impulse. The property market is very important for China's growth prospects. It's also quite important for the global economy via, the, the, um, via commodities. And so that's another pressure point that, that is particularly hitting in a way the emerging markets that have been providing these 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 commodities. Um, China, at the same time, of course, has has been boosted by this strong surge in durable demand, which uh, which it produces to a significant extent. Uh, but of course, that pressure, as we we said, also will gradually be fading. Um, what uh, a perspective on the on the global rating uh, rating horizon and rating outlook. Clearly, last year, the pandemic was the worst on record in terms of downgrades, the highest number of downgrades. We had the highest number of negative outlooks. Um, and in a way, that, that might be unsurprising, given the scale of the problem. Um, we are still seeing a very substantial um, uh, balance bias on the, on the right-hand side, it's clear towards negative outlooks, much, much higher number in net terms, net of, um, net of the positive outlooks, or in gross terms. So in total, out of 120 sovereigns that we rate, 31 are still on negative. Already 
um, down from the worst of the crisis la mid last year, but, but still very substantial. And you would assume uh, that that still leads to a fair number of downgrades. So the pressure um, for, on, for the, for the net, net upgrades, um, for, for that to turn stable uh, to, to, towards zero is still quite some time to go. Um, in terms of the factors that we are now looking for that may be triggering uh, many of those that, that might be, or some of those that, that are now still on negative outlook for, to move towards a downgrade, we are certainly looking to some extent at, at politics, um, which we have often identified as a, often a driving factor for crisis or at least a supporting factor. But the one big standout factor for, for the rating cycle right now is clearly the level of, of government debt, um, which has, has risen quite dramatically, is much higher than, um, than, than before the crisis or even in the longer term. We have now 30% of the 121 sovereigns that we rate above um, with a government debt ratio of 80, uh, above 80%. Um, in 2010, we only had half as much, 15%. And so if you believe that that mat matters, that matters for growth prospects or for credit worthiness, clearly something has changed in that perspective. Um, so, um, and this is becoming, coming, putting the, the solvents under pressure in the context of a situation where interest rates right now are, of course, extremely low. But the prospects, as we discussed, um, and the prospects for interest rates are, are clearly upside. You can discuss on how fast that process will, will go, but the, up, the pressure is on the, ups, on the upside um, towards, towards tighter, tighter monetary policy. So what does this picture mean for the GCC? Um, so, the GCC has quite a diversity of, of ratings ranging anywhere from AA in Kuwait and Abu Dhabi to Bahrain with a B plus, a B plus stable. Um, the pandemic has had an impact on, on the region. So we downgraded Bahrain once to B plus. We downgraded Oman in two steps by, by two notches. So now it's double B minus. We also temporarily had Saudi Arabia on a negative outlook, but um, there we, we felt that um, the, the, the situation has, has stabilized sufficiently and we changed the outlook back to stable from negative, but we still have the outlook on negative for, for Kuwait. Um, there are some similarities from the rating perspective for the GCC. One, once they are all in some way and to some degree quite heavily dependent on, on oil. They are also somewhat similar in the sense that governance levels are somewhat lower than, than other, other sovereigns that they might be, be compared to. Um, but they're also relatively wealthy. And um, one thing that just really distinguishes them, the, the, the GCC region, is the extent to which the balance sheet is decisive. When we say balance sheet in the GCC, of course, like everywhere else, we look at government debt um, that is important and that we see on the left-hand side of the chart, the, uh, the blue, blue columns, um, with quite a, quite a range. And in fact, many, particularly of the higher rated ones, at relatively low low levels of debt. Only Qatar of the investment grade ones has a debt ratio above the 80% ratio, that, um, uh, ratio that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, but in the GCC, another element that we also look at, look at for the balance sheet is the, the broader public sector. So the government related enterprises, or um, if you want to call it this, state-owned state -owned, state -owned enterprises. That's the red column. And in quite a number of the GCC sovereigns, this, uh, the contingent liabilities arising from the, the GIE sector are quite substantial, are quite, quite large. And, and so um, something we, we look at uh, quite a bit. But as you see from this chart, maybe, um, I mean, on the other, one hand, Kuwait on the very left with a double A, but Qatar is the second on the right, a double A minus. The correlation is not, not super clear. 
Um, and one of the factors for that is just that in, in the GCC, the debt isn't quite so important because the asset side, which in most sovereigns is not an important component of a, of a, of a rating assessment, most sovereigns don't have much, at least not much liquid cash, um, liquid assets. And um, that's obviously different in the GCC with where we have Kuwait with sovereign net foreign assets. So um, assets in the, in, in say, um, the sovereign wealth funds, KA and so on, minus the external debt of the government at 700% in, in Kuwait um, and, and 300, 200% in Abu Dhabi, UAE and, and Qatar. Um, that is a key distinguishing feature of the, of the GCC. And, and um, it's maybe interesting to look at that from the extreme case of Kuwait, which is also on, on negative outlook, as I mentioned. So this, the 700% the of GDP essentially would allow, allow Kuwait to continue spending as it does at the moment for more than 10 years. And without, even if revenues completely stopped, if for whatever, whatever reason, all prices fell to zero and there were no other revenues that, that the government could take. For 10 years, they could continue spending, for more than 10 years, they could continue spending from, the, from their asset position. Um, but at the same time, and so, in, in fact, we, we sometimes get to the question, so why is Kuwait not at AAA? I mean, this, this is a, so, such a strong, so should be such, such a strong support. Um, what, the reason why it's not at AAA, and in fact, the reason right now why it is on a negative outlook is that institutional uh, obstacles are, 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 are complicating. Um, and in, in Kuwait's specific case, the government does not have really access to this to, to the Future Generations Fund, which is the source of most of the 700% of GDP sovereign net foreign assets. Um, and it does have a certain amount, not a big amount, but it does have a certain amount of debt that it will need to service. And that it will, uh, that, that it, uh, and, and it no longer has a lot of assets, almost non, no assets in its general reserve fund. And so, this raises a bit of questions that are quite similar to the situation in the United States with the, with the debt ceiling. Um, we are confident ultimately that Kuwait will overcome this in one way or another, but um, it's still a sufficiently challenging situation that we, we left it and, and put it on, on negative, negative outlook. Um, maybe just another point to, to mention and highlight here that, just that it's slightly unusual um, we have the UAE and Abu Dhabi both as sovereigns. Of course, in a way, these are different levels of sovereigns. They're also at slightly different levels. Um, although the sovereign, sovereign assets of the UAE and Abu Dhabi are essentially identical, to some extent that is because the denominator here, GDP for Abu Dhabi is just Abu Dhabi for the UAE. It's the, the, all of the UAE. Um, and, um, and not really any, any more fundamental differences there. Um, so let me turn, as given, given this importance of the balance sheet, um, um, it's obviously crucial to look at the, the performance on, on budget balances. Um, one thing to note first for the whole range on the left-hand side, the whole range of sovereigns in the region Deficits have balances have deteriorated very sharply in 2020, with um, um, deficits well above 10 percent in um, in Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. Um, but at the same time, we can also say that uh, that we are seeing a sharp recovery in 2021, driven in large part by the recovery in in oil prices. Now, what that, does that mean for the debt ratios? So we've seen this sharp rise in debt in, in 2020, but uh, um, and in a way you, you could, can just assume relatively similar movements um, to in the sovereign net foreign assets. Uh, sharp rise in debt and sovereign, uh, deterioration in sovereign net foreign assets in 2020. Um, and then for the most part, part more or less a stabilization uh, in, in subsequent subsequent 
years with some differentiation uh, depending on the scale of the of the fiscal fiscal performance um, now um, um, of course these are forecasts that are based on our forecasts uh, on, on our forecast for oil prices and and it's it's kind of crucial to understand the impact that different scenarios you might have different scenarios than we do um, for oil prices have on the public finances which then have big repercussions as we will see on on the gdp growth um, so on the on the left hand side what we see here is um, firstly on the y-axis the different sovereigns according to their to the share of hydrocarbons in, in nominal gdp uh, Bahrain is the lowest um, with little more than 10% and Kuwait is the highest with almost 40% of their, um, their GDP coming from the hydro hydrocarbon sector. Obviously, this then also has an implication for the, the uh, imp impl impact of, the, of a change in oil prices on public deficits. So in Bahrain, if oil prices are $10 higher, say, than, than what we are assuming. Um, this would lead to the budget balance to be two percentage points better than, than would otherwise be the case. In Kuwait, it would be more than 6.5 percentage points better, given it's a significantly higher reliance um, and dependence on oil as a source of revenue and a source of overall uh, the economic performance. Um, a way of um, presenting that is looking at the 2022 budget balance uh, where um, for, for different scenarios of oil prices, 45, 55, 65, and, and 75, um, clearly big differences. I mean, if you look at on the extreme side, for example, again, Kuwait, um, 20, um, in the worst case, 45, and um, almost zero in the best case in terms of budget budget deficit um, so another way of looking at this this differentiation is looking at the fiscal break even or price of um, of oil so essentially the price at which the fiscal balance would be um, would be neither deficit nor surplus just in balance and um, there has been some improvement in recent years, and to some extent, as a consequence of this, for most countries, for, for most of the higher rated sovereigns, uh, UAE, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, um, the oil price would be, the, the break-even oil price is around $55, which is roughly in line with our long-term, medium-term price, price forecast of 53 um, but of course, quite a bit lower than the current oil price. And in fact, also the oil price that quite conservatively we put in for 2021 at 63 and for 2022 at 55. Um, it's quite different for Bahrain and Kuwait. Kuwait could be just about in, um, in, in balance at an oil price of 75, while Bahrain would even then not be in, uh, in balance, would even run a when a significant deficit at an oil price of, um, of 70, uh, 75 or higher. Um, but one thing to emphasize is that there has been quite a lot of improvement on the fiscal front, essentially th since 2014. So the bars on the right-hand side essentially represent the improvement of uh, the underlying fiscal balance. So the, the non-oil, um, fiscal fiscal uh, primary fiscal balance divided by the non-oil gdp and a lot of that has happened since the the prior uh, oil price shock in 2014-15 but for the most part we also expect that to be continuing in the coming years um, as even as as oil prices are somewhat higher than the the worst uh, worst outcome um, in, in 2020. Now, there's quite a lot of uncertainty around that, uh, that, that scenario. Um, a lot of discussion about the, the procyclicality of the GCC uh, fiscal balances. Typically, we have seen um, 
uh, fiscal balances fluctuate quite strongly with the with the with the gov with um, with with oil prices. So higher oil prices, more spending; lower oil prices, low spending. That's what we call procyclical. Um, we believe that for various reasons this kind of procyclicality is going to be somewhat lower now that oil prices are high again. A core reason for this, I think, is that the shock of 2014-15 and again of 2020 is now um, quite deeply in the bones of the, the planners in, in many of the GCC countries. And they, they very well understand the risks of relying too heavily on, on oil revenues. Um, another reason I think is that certainly in some countries, institutionalization of fiscal processes has made some progress. And that means that it's, it's less likely to happen as, as was certainly the case before, um, that as soon as you see uh, fiscal, fiscal spending rise, uh, oil prices rise, fiscal spending gets, goes, goes overboard again. Um, before 2015, that was the case, even intra-year. But uh, so far, we are certainly not seeing that with um, for 2021. Um, for the first half of 2021, we still see expenditure being quite tight, actually expenditure being reduced, um, and so not really any strong signs of, of such a such a percyclicality coming along. Um, if oil prices stay, say, above $75 per barrel for quite a while and uh, people become more confident about uh, uh, prices staying there, that probably would, would then lead to a gradual easing of, of commitment to fiscal, fiscal stabilization. But that is not a, a scenario we, we see as particularly likely as, as I say, our medium term scenario for oil prices is um, more towards 50 55 uh, $53 per bell. Implications for financing, maybe just, just briefly. Um, so here we play down, play through the different net financing requirement for the for the different GCC sovereigns. Um, clearly for different scenarios, clearly between 45 and 65, it's uh, it's a world of difference, or even 75, it's a world of difference, uh, say for Saudi Arabia, whether it's uh, 50 billion that needs to be financed, or whether um, Saudi Arabia could be building its stocks by 20 billion US dollars. And um, similarly, of course, that is also the case for the gross issuance that we, we would be assuming for the GCC, um, a, a base case around $55 next year uh, is, a hundred, is, um, sorry, is, a, is around 100 billion. But um, clearly, if uh, oil prices come in at six, 65, that would be, be massively, massively lower. Um, just briefly, a, a few words on growth. I mean, clearly, uh, the, the, um, the pandemic has, uh, in terms of infection rates, has eased recently. Um, certainly pressure for the risk of new waves coming up. But uh, I mean, the GCC really has, has um, shamed much of the bigger advanced countries in terms of vaccination rates. And so the risks from that front are probably somewhat lower than they would have been without this, this very substantial progress. Um, and, um, um, and so that obviously also then has, has impact on, on GDP growth. We, for most of the world, 2021 is the peak year of the recovery and growth, but that is not the case for the GCC, and that is very much driven by, um, by the, the, the tapering of, uh, of OPEC production cuts, um, because the first quarter of 2020 was actually a period of very strong production. We are seeing a decline for if, or at least a stability of um, of oil production in 2021 for several of the the OPEC um, OPEC sovereigns, and but then a very substantial recovery as the tapering makes progress and feeds through into the full year averages, and and then some some slight further progress in in 2023. Um, let me 
also uh, conclude maybe by by going through a few sovereigns of of some importance um, that are often being discussed. So Bahrain, for one, where the debt stabilization remains quite a challenge, they are still getting the benefits of a the GCC support package from 2018. Um, the red bars in the chart on the left are essentially the the support that was was pro promised then, and that I, we think more or less will be forthcoming. forthcoming. But if you compare that to the um, bond amortization requirements over the coming years, it's still um, very low, and and there's no prospect of fiscal surpluses that could be allowing to to pay for that. So the pressure from from that fund to have more is still very much on. Um, another si way of looking at it on the right hand side is just that the situation just did not pan out as was planned under the under the package uh, the the GCC support which was of course combined with the fiscal balance plan where debt levels turned out much higher essentially uh, to a large extent because of the pandemic and and then a pandemic induced to some extent also is a bit of a standstill on on fiscal reforms we we can certainly talk about that in in the discussions um on oman just first point maybe on the left hand side just how dramatic the deterioration of balance sheets has been um sovereign net foreign assets turning negative um the red line on the right hand side a right hand scale and debt obviously rising very sharply. One really, really encouraging thing is that we believe that the the change in, in leadership has led to a big shift in the pace of reforms. We believe that the fiscal fiscal plans are the most credible that Oman has presented um, in, in many years. And um, much of that will be has a good prospect of, of being implemented. What we are a bit worried about is that firstly, I mean, there are still challenges to the implementation of these, these, these plans, and those come from the the um, from, from social pressures essentially. Um, we have seen protests, but they also come from growth prospects um, in, in the sense that the 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 government i think makes assumptions that are not implaus implausible or impossible but that would be challenging if you consider that there will be continued significant fiscal consolidation measures there, there will be more taxes there will be uh, spending cuts which usually have a significant impact on economic growth while at the same time um, the government would be needing some growth to actually have the revenue the 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 increase in revenue that um, to, 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 to achieve these, these targets. Um, so, and, and this is kind of, these kind of two, two things, the, the social pressures and, and the uncertainty about the impact of consolidation on growth is why we still have Oman on, on a negative, negative outlook. Very briefly on Qatar, um, there, the Northfield expansion is clearly a massive, um, massive program, massive, um, in a way, you could say game changer in terms of longer term fiscal fiscal performance. In the short term, of course, it will lead to quite a bit of fluctuation on on growth. Um, it it is not entirely clear yet how exactly this is going to be be funded, but um, um, in the in the longer term, it it should be um, once the the gas comes on stream, leading to at least the possibility of a decline in debt. While at the moment, Qatar is relatively leveraged, if you remember uh, earlier slide, relatively high level of debt, a relatively high level of um, GRE, um, government related enterprise liabilities, admittedly a large sovereign wealth fund, but certainly more leveraged than most of the other high, uh, highly rated sovereigns. And that comes together with a banking sector that is also quite strongly leveraged. Um, there was a big shock in 2017 from the from the Gulf crisis, where you could really see suddenly a big outflow of deposits. But in fact, we have now returned to the status quo ante, where where the dependence on external deposits has is actually bigger than it was was at that time, and so that's a major worry. And maybe to conclude on 
on Saudi Arabia, one thing that um, that maybe is worth emphasizing there is that it uh, Saudi Arabia is maybe the best example, but not the only example of a of how the how governments in the region are trying to square the the circle of um, trying to 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 consolidate their their fiscal deficits while at the same time staying committed to to job creation to to addressing the issue of um, significant numbers of young people coming into the job market, and that is by shifting the spending off off budget, and clearly that is something that is worrying rating agencies to to some extent. We are looking very closely at that and and um, are monitoring that very closely because, of course, ultimately the sovereign the government still stands in for any liabilities that are created by by on that front. Um, on the right hand side, you see. The the blue bars are, is capex from the government, which has been coming down. But it's increase. It's if 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 the plans that have been announced are implemented, it would be increasingly um, expanded by uh, by spending from the PIF and potentially from from other other funds. So let me conclude here and then maybe see um, whether whether there are any any questions already coming coming forward. So uh, one question that I see is um, the prospect of the durability of the exchange rate pegs in the in the region. Um, so the picture is is slightly varied, but it's not completely different. We, we are pretty confident about the pegs across the region, and that includes the somewhat weaker sovereigns, um, Bahrain B plus and and Oman uh, double B minus. Um, it's, it's kind of relatively obvious for the higher rated ones because they just have so many assets that attacking those, um, attacking those packs, pegs could be very costly and would be very risky. And um, at least with the current oil price projections, the overall balance sheet will not shift to an extent that the capaci their capacity to, to defend those packs will be fundamentally jeopardized. Bahrain, Bahrain, on the other hand, is the, the opposite. Um, is it really has a very weak external balance sheet. Reserves have increased a little bit over the last two years, but from extremely low levels. So um, um, if you just compare Saudi Arabia on one extreme has reserve coverage of its imports of well above 20 months, uh, Bahrain has not had it above two two months for a long time, um, so uh, a huge huge difference and and relatively weak weak reserves. Also, uh, somewhat weakened weakening over the last last year or so, the the um, the reserves of the banking sector. Um, so the uh, sworn asset position of the banking sector. Which is which also needs to be taken into consideration as a risk for for potential pegs, but we remain essentially confident about the the support from from the from the rest of the GCC for geopolitical reasons to some extent because of nervousness about what would happen to the pegs of the richer states. If the 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 weakest link is starting to be be, be coming under attack, um, it, it's not the strongest argument, but but it's certainly something that that will that 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 will contribute to to help to bring in other so, other Gulf states to to Bahrain support. We also see a um, a stabilization of the balance sheet in in Oman, and. Um, so that, there, the, the risk, the pressures are declining. While we, we certainly don't have the same degree of confidence of potential support, but signs for potential support are certainly improving. And there, there are quite good, um, in quite a number of meetings between Saudi Arabia and Oman, for example, recently, that um, at least indicate a benign perspective, and um, could could lead to to support forthcoming. Um, so other questions. Um, the impact of the the carbon transition for the uh, for OPEC. So um, 
what it means for OPEC member states and whether whether it makes their relations more competitive. Hello. Um, okay, I have five more minutes. So uh, one one point about the one point that is often being argued about the competition between GCC member states, just generally OPEC member states, in terms of um, production quotas, which we clearly saw played out in August this year, uh, when there was no agreement about the next steps for um, quota tapering because of significant disagreement. Um, one argument there is that many people feel the GCC countries might be becoming more desperate. They have massive reserves in the ground. And there may well be a prospect because of transition that they will not be able to make use of these, these reserves on the, on, on the ground. And my perspective on this is that uh, the, the states will, will remain rational. How much, however much they will have in the ground doesn't really matter. They will try to optimize the amount that they can get from producing. And that means that they will adjust the, the the quotas um, overall to the extent that they get the optimal price that they that they that they can achieve for for the for 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 getting the total volume and price equation as right as possible, and that means and and that is has been the case like like that all the time. Of course, always they would have liked to produce more. Um, let's say. Um, the UAE would have liked to produce more to the to the detriment of Saudi Arabia to to get more revenue, but they haven't done that because um, it was it was clear that it was was not achievable. That will remain the case. All of them will know that they can't just um, leave OPEC and play it alone. They would be opening up a scenario that is quite similar to the scenario that we saw at the start of the pandemic, where everybody was fighting everyone, and which was clearly to the worst. Of their um, their um, to every uh, worst of, of all the GCC countries' interest. Um, uh, another question um, is essentially on the diversification front. One a question actually we we're getting quite a bit is the degree of confidence that um, whether countries can make progress on diversification and. Um, key point there is it's quite important to differentiate between different types of diversification so clearly quite a bit of progress is being made uh, essentially across the gcc in terms of revenue government revenue diversification we didn't have vat until uh, a few few years ago there is now even the prospect of of um, potentially income tax in in oman and maybe that would be something that that might be spreading more more widely Clearly, some diversification on that front has has now happened. Um, but in terms of reducing dependence of the overall economy on oil, it will be much much more challenging. Um, the the projects that are on the way are often very grand scale, but um, certainly uh, too uncertain that we would be comfortable on our side to factor in their success that they they will be able to wean themselves off the dependence on oil. So th that remains um, a very, very difficult game. Uh, just looking across all countries that have tried to diversify, there are really only very few that have been very successful at it. It's a, it's a very, very challenging task because, um, because of just uh, the habits that have grown in, but also because of the macroeconomic typical patterns that if you export something that is essentially in the ground that typically um, has implications for your, for your exchange rate, for your competitiveness, that is very hard to, to overcome. And, um, and maybe we can squeeze in very quickly one uh, question on Bahrain. We, we had big news um, over the weekend. The question is on, on the VAT rate rise and, and what, that, what that means. Um, it's clearly big news that that this is now now coming. I, I don't think we would have expected it quite quite at this time. Um, but 
I mean, it needs to be seen in context. Uh, as as I show, showed in the in the chart, there there are real real challenges for Bahrain in terms of the um, the the financing requirements that it has towards the end of the um, the, the the program um, and the support packages package. And I think it was also pretty clear that the other GCC members they are also under consolidation pressures. They would be somewhat unhappy to to provide further support. Um, they had been unhappy to provide support without without some degree of consolidation measures. They have, some measures have come, and they would want to see more measures. And it, it would be a bit bit challenging to see, for example, for Saudis who are currently paying a VAT rate of 15% um, to, to pay, to, to provide transfers to, to Bahrain where the VAT rate is just 5%. So some kind of narrowing of that divergence um, might make, might pay, pave the way for some, a renewal of that package. But that package is absolutely necessary and crucial for, um, a, for avoiding a downward spiral. It's not yet a, something that would really um, raise hopes of a significant upward spiral that, that really could, could lift um, Bahrain out of a relatively tight, tight spot. Um, I, I may still have time for... Okay, so um, let me close with this. Um, um, I hope that that has been a useful overview. And um, of course, as um, we, we at Fitch are always very happy to, to, um, to hear from people. So if you have any, any further questions, um, uh, we'll be very happy to, to respond to that and discuss.